Welcome back for a Sunday edition of Collider Mailbag. I'm back. I'm Perry. That's Roca. Mm -hmm. I slept in my clothes from the Saturday mailbag, so I'm ready to go for the Sunday mailbag. Let's make this happen. Just had my pancakes, just had my bacon and eggs. Let's this, do it! This is what happens when you haven't been on mailbag. They're too smart for that nonsense. Are they? Yeah. Son of a, all also, right, it's, fine. it's the holiday weekend. Tonight yeah. is Christmas Eve. If you're celebrating, I hope you're enjoying yourself today and have good plans tonight and tomorrow. Right now, we got some movies to talk about. Let's do it. We might have a little Star Wars to talk. I, I put like a weird accent on there. <laughs> Star Wars to talk about. Uh, because that's what that's what we do here, and that's what's hot right now. So sure. we're jumping right into it. And I think, are we go? Yeah, we're kind of going there. Question number one comes from Rob, who writes, "Tell me if the same thing happens to you, folks. You see a movie that has an element in it that surprises you with its badness, an element that really stands out, but on subsequent viewings, its impact is sharply reduced because you're expecting it." Once the surprise of it wears off, somehow I'm able to block it out or dull the pain of it to an extent. <laughs> I call it the Jar Jar effect. Does this happen to you? I expect this will also be true of the Canto Bite sequence or the ahem, got milk scene in Last Jedi. So, Rob, I will say that in my personal experience, mm -hmm. and this question will contain no spoilers, so if you haven't seen Last Jedi for whatever reason, don't worry. I will say that that was not the case with Canto Bite for me. It oh. didn't lessen it at all. I still look at that, and okay. I can't make any excuses for some of the flaws I see. The got milk thing, though, yeah. You that, didn't like that. No, I, I found did it, like it. I did. I did find it very mm -hmm. awkward in my first viewing, but in my second viewing, I kind of found it funnier, and mm -hmm. I think more in line with what that joke was intended to be. Another Star Wars example I could throw out there is the Rathar scene from Force Awakens. Oh, yeah. When I first watched it, I'm like, ooh, CG creature, I don't want it. And then when I watched it again, I kind of do like the dynamic mm -hmm. it sets up between Han Solo and his business and these groups that are after him. And really, I think the geography of that scene is kind of impressive. Yeah. And I, I do love that, that final moment that we get between uh, Rey and Finn and what her basically not telling him that she saved him means. And mm -hmm. I like thinking back to moments like that. Yeah. I think for me, the rat scene at the end of Departed, so unnecessary, such a good film, right? And it's like Scorsese going, do you get it? Do you get it? And it just was so unnecessary. And it was surprising for a filmmaker like Scorsese. And unfortunately, I've never been able to get past that scene. Aww. In fact, when I watch the movie, as soon as the camera starts to move, I turn it off and go, what a good movie. What a great movie. Uh, and then uh, the Quentin Tarantino scene in Django Unchained, that, to me, is just a, a scene that makes absolutely no sense. It's the worst Australian accent I've ever heard. And I love Tarantino, so please don't come after me for that. But And the film is so great. And it's, yes, you could say, well, this is kind of those cheesy homage to those all, the earlier Django films of Franco Nero. But still, it's an unsettling thing when you're creating such a fantastic film based on those earlier films of Franco Nero. The Brad Pitt scene in 12 Years a Slave, what is that doing in there? I get that you produced the film. You don't cast a worldwide superstar like Brad Pitt to play a, you know, a guy building a house who ends up being the integral reason why he gets to escape. I thought that was, or gets to leave, and I think that's that was a huge mistake. Uh, and I really want to say two things, the Mickey Rooney scene in Breakfast at Tiffany's. I I've seen that movie two or three times. You just cannot get past that. It is such a terrible, horrible racist interpretation of a Japanese man, and I can't believe it got they got away with that in the 60s. Um, and, you know, and also the blackface, speaking of Christmas, in Holiday Inn. It shouldn't be there. I wish they could take it out of those movies and just release those movies all over again without those scenes. And I guarantee you, you'll get the same box office and people will still love them because you don't need those scenes. All wonderful examples, but yep. you didn't play by Rob's rules. What was Rob's they were, rules? They were supposed to be things that got better on repeat viewings. Really? <laughs> but, but yeah. But, but that, that's, that's that's sharply quite, reduced. That's, that's, oh, uh, I apologize. That's one take. So Roka has a different take. All right, um, all right. I'll throw out one more for Rob, though. And I'm going to say The Room in general because mm. obviously because of the disaster artist, we're talking about The room even more so than we might have in yeah. years past given how many times we've seen it but I just remember the first time I watched it being able to to laugh at it of course but mm -hmm. also just oh cringing just being so sad for what these people are you know taking part in that is not going to pan out the way they wanted and then I watched it again yeah. And I think that that the the cringiness and I hate that word cringe I hate when people call everything cringe but that feeling that I did want to cringe while watching it kind of went away and I started to appreciate that communal laugh that you can get out of it, right. which, you know, maybe isn't the greatest thing either. Mm -hmm. But that's my example of something that I think uh, w was eased or lessened the second time around. I don't know. Rob, I don't have that gear. 
if it bothers me, it bothers me, and I can never get past it. So I hate to break it to you. That's just not my gear. But so I apologize if I didn't answer your question 100% correctly, but I answered it honestly. Okay. I don't have a gear that I can go past scenes that I don't like. Well, maybe you could fully appease our next viewer's yeah, submitted question. <laughs> uh, this one comes from Jimmy Two Times, who writes, Hey, Collider Crew, thanks for always entertaining me when I need it most. Always appreciate the content you put out every day. Okay, on to the question. Are you as upset as I am that the beautiful shape of water did not make the short list of of movies looking to be nominated for Best Makeup and Hairstyling. It's an absolute travesty considering Suicide Squad actually won last year. Do you think it's a bad sign for its chances for Best Picture or Best Director? Mm. Thanks so much for considering my question. This question really just crushes me. Yeah. And when I heard that news, I I almost thought it was it was fake because you know how yeah. there there's some yeah. like fake accounts and they'll they'll be playful with uh, headlines like an April Fool's right. type joke. Yeah. I, th I that thought that it was a joke. Yeah, yeah, whatever that is. Yeah. I thought it was a joke the first time I read it, and then I realized it's not. That I can't make any excuses for this. I can't even begin to understand yeah. why that wouldn't have been nominated. In I don't I don't know how exactly they choose their nominees. I know that each branch whittles it down until they have a certain amount that could eventually get nominated. Yeah. I know that's how it works, but I don't know who's responsible for the whittling down process. And I don't, maybe, maybe people voted for other things because they thought Shape of Water was a lock. I don't know. I'm really just like, that makes no sense because mm -hmm. I'm just trying to find an excuse for what happened here. I don't understand, really. If if I were in that branch of the Academy and I was voting, I would no doubt, at the very least, give it a nomination. Mm -hmm. I'd be embarrassed and ashamed that this is not because Bright was moved into that slot, and Bright, from what we've seen in the in the trailers, there's some it, there's nothing they did in that makeup that you didn't see in Alien Nation already with that film with Mandy Patinkin and James Caan. What you see in Shape of Water is one of the most gorgeous and beautifully well done makeup and hairstyle throughout the whole movie. Just the Doug Jones look, the, uh, the, the all of that about the amphibian man, all the hair that's done by Sally Hawkins, the uh, general overall vibe of the film, mm -hmm. all everything about it is so specifically well done and fantastically artistically well done that it's embarrassment and a shame that it's been removed from contention. I don't know what the system is that removed it, but whatever the system is, is absolutely broken to not let a film like this get its well-deserved accolades and consideration for an award. Yeah, just to give you guys a little perspective because you brought up Bright. Yeah. So the list right now includes Bright, Darkest Hour, Ghost in the Shell, Guardians Ghost of the Galaxy, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, I, Tanya, Vic Victoria, and Abdul, and Wonder. Uh, really, the, the three that I can't make a case for, and, and I haven't seen Bright at this point, mm. so I can't comment on that one, but Ghost in the Shell, and as much as I love Guardians, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 over The Shape of Water, and let's also not forget It. Why right. isn't it Pennywise. on this yeah, list? Yeah. I mean, Pennywise in so many different forms, on top of all the makeup and hairstyling that's required mm -hmm. of, of everything in a period piece like that, I, I, that I don't understand. So I would remove if it was up to me, and sadly it's not, mm -hmm. Ghost in the Shell and Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and I would give a slot to Shape of Water, no doubt, and I would probably give an honor to it as well. Yeah, and I would put Shape of Water as the winner. Like, absolutely, of all the ones you've just listed. And I don't think it will affect the second part of the question. I don't think it will affect Best Picture or Best Director. I think it's getting way too many accolades, way too many consideration from mm -hmm. all the critics groups uh, and all the awards organizations that there's no way it won't be in consideration for Best Picture and be a nominee. I hope you're right. Again, I don't know the, the number breakdown of yeah. how many people are in that branch of the Academy, so how it could affect its chances in, let's say, Best Picture. But right. I, I wouldn't think that it was as big as some of the other branches, so mm -hmm. maybe it won't matter, but oh, tell people how much you love Shape of Water <laughs> if you've seen it, and if you do love it, and if you appreciate the creature design there. <laughs> All right, so moving on to question number three, mm -hmm. and uh, a warning here, because this question does pertain to Star Wars The Last Jedi, and in order to discuss this question, we will need to discuss what happens in the movie, so here is your spoiler warning right now. If, oh, uh, bye, Jonathan. <laughs> if you haven't seen the movie, tune out. Come back for question number four. So this question comes from JC, who writes, Hello, Collider crew. Who do you think will be the main villain for Star Wars post-Episode Nine? I hope for the Sith Army making a comeback. Thank you and keep up the great work. So the reason I issued the spoiler warning is we can't really get there without talking about what could happen in yeah. Episode Nine. Yeah. And it, Given what happens in The Last Jedi, I think that's a really important question to be considering right now. And 
I have said in the spoiler review, I really like what they did with Snoke as mm -hmm. a character. I was not into Snoke in the first movie. I thought he was a, a big waste, and I didn't really see what he could bring to the franchise. I didn't like the look of the character. I didn't like how they included in, him in the narrative. And I know and I, I understand why some people think that his death in the second installment of this trilogy is a little bit of a letdown, especially when you, we've spent so much time. Yeah. When, who is Snoke? Where did he come from? Right. I understand that. The reason that it works so well for me is because I think it serves Kylo Ren as a character mm -hmm. so especially well. And the fact that the Last Jedi essentially teed it up to be Kylo versus Rey. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to make for such a rich and exciting conclusion for this trilogy and possibly for these characters. Yeah. I'm so excited about that. And also, when you have Kylo at the helm, it also could be a good reason to finally explore the Knights of Ren, mm -hmm. especially because it is mentioned in the movie yep. that he took some students with him we don't learn anything about those students or where they come from. We don't really know all that much about the Knights of Ren. So I think that could be a great opportunity to finally explore that. And then, you know, when we're thinking about a franchise, assuming the good beats the bad, yeah. it's hard to say where they're going to go from there because I also don't know Lucasfilm's plan at that point. I mean, are we just going to take the, the saga or the Skywalker films and essentially replace them with whatever Ryan Johnson is working mm -hmm. on versus saga, saga films versus standalone films, I'm trying to say right. here. But I, I think the problem with answering this right now is we don't really know. So really just assuming that good beats bad. Here's... I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what I would say. If we're going to go with Ryan Johnson, and, and let's just speculate, because if Ryan Johnson showed us anything in uh, Last Jedi, it's he's going to zig when you think he's going to zag, and when the property thinks it's going to zag, he's going to zig. And so if he's going to take over and do this trilogy and fully finish out this trilogy, I, the only thing we can speculate is just like shots in the dark about what might be, who might be the villain. And my possibility, because we've seen this repeat itself in both these trilogies, it'll be someone close to this, close to the maybe, if Broom Boy is the lead, then maybe it's one of those kids down there who was doing the, who was one of those, uh, 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 what do you call the slave kids that were down yeah. there at Canto Bite. Maybe one of those kids turns out to be the villain for Broom Boy, or maybe Broom Boy becomes the villain. We so don't you're, know. You're totally buying the idea oh, that Broom Boy is leading. If it isn't, then there's no point to the Canto Bite scene at all. That's not true all. at all. In my opinion, there is no point to the Canto Bite scene. They don't succeed. Okay. They don't succeed. They don't. They don't affect anything. And DJ gets to get away with the money and the ship. So the other possibility is Kylo. And this is the revolutionary hot take for me. Or yeah, hot take for me is I think uh, Kylo survives and becomes the main villain. And Broom Boy is. This is like 20 years later. Broom Boy comes and has to fight Kylo Ren. Now Kylo, like Vader, fully into his evilness. Because if you only give him one movie to be fully evil, I don't think you'll, you'll really get to uh, enjoy the character of Kylo Ren. And I really think they redeemed him so well in Last Jedi versus the emo Kylo jokes from Force Awakens. You get a fully realized young man coming into his power. He needs to rule for a while, and I think that would be incredible if he comes back in the new trilogy. I That piques my interest just because I flat out said the expected thing would, yeah. would be to have good beat evil. Right. So if they go that route, but let me just ask you one question because sure. I mentioned it there. So how I took the value of what happens in Canto Bite, or at least yeah. part of it, I'm not talking about all the characters, I'm just talking about Broom Boy, is yeah. establishing Broom Boy as kind of a nod to what happens on Tatooine and things With like Luke. that, but mm -hmm. also the idea of spreading the word of the resistance mm -hmm. and also teasing because... There, we don't know anything about other Force users teasing that there is a younger generation that could be trained. That's just the value I saw in mm -hmm. that, Ver versus it just being, you know, a, a silly uh, chase sequence with CG creatures. But I think there's value <laughs> of it since a broom boy. I think that's the value, and I get what yeah. you're saying. But I think the resistance has lived on for multiple generations. We yeah. see we see young people in the in in crate there hiding themselves. So they must have known about the resistance for quite some time. The resistance always exists, just like the just like uh, the Empire will always exist, or the First Order, whatever iteration it takes, it will always exist. Good will always exist. Evil will always exist. That's just life. Yeah. All right. So there, there you have it. That spoilers are done. Hopefully, a spoiler <laughs> alert will come won't back, pop Jonathan, up so you guys can come back. <laughs> All right. So our next question, question number four, comes from Matt Andrews, who writes. 
My family's tradition is to head to the movies on Christmas Day. I would love to take my conservative parents to see Shape of Water, but worry they might not be able to handle the graphic nudity. Is it very graphic? Yeah. <laughs> if so, what is a good alternative in your opinion? I'll toss that one to you. Yeah, yeah it's very. <laughs> Here's what I'd say. It's surprisingly very graphic, uh, yet incredibly sweet and very much in the vein of a love story. So the opening is self-satisfaction and that is really shocking to see an open. So if, unless your grandparents or, or parents are very advanced in their uh, uh, approach to movies, I think it will make you uncomfortable to watch this with them. And to be honest, it makes everybody uncomfortable to watch any kind of sex scenes or graphic uh, self-satisfaction scenes with their parents or their grandparents on Christmas Day, no less. So, uh, yeah, I would say that it is pretty graphic. So, if you want to avoid that, avoid that. There are go take them to Star Wars. There are plenty of other films to go see. This ho even go see Terrible Father Figures or The Greatest Showman, which has no sex and it's just a bunch of musical numbers and then a nice little story in the middle of it. So, there's a lot of things you can go. Even if you want to go to uh, see All the Money in the World, it's a very it's a more uh, complex film but not a lot of graphic nudity in that film at all. So there's these, these kinds of things. So if you want to avoid it completely, there are other options. But yes, there is graphic nudity in this film, but it's still a beautiful love story and an important story to tell nowadays. I'm so immature. What? <laughs> I don't know, just hearing you try to like sidestep any type of extremely special yeah, thing to describe it, yeah. for the movie. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's difficult for me to answer this just because my parents aren't conservative and I've always grown up watching whatever I wanted. So I wouldn't say The Shape of Water is oh my God graphic, but when you're talking about maybe a conservative type of relationship, yeah. That to me is the standout quality where, mm -hmm. you know, it is not easy to sell a relationship like that. And from my perspective, I think Guillermo del Toro did it quite successfully. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you're not comfortable with, with material like that, mm -hmm. I can see someone kind of like repelling from it just for that alone, not even the sexual nature of some of the scenes. Mm -hmm. With alternatives, though, if you're concerned about it, so my list, because I actually just went over this with my mom. Mm -hmm. She asked me to, to go back and forth with her and try to figure out what we're going to see, what we're going to watch at home. And right. our list right now includes, we're going to see Star Wars. Mm -hmm. not, not all on Christmas Day, but we right. are. I think we are going to see Star Wars on Christmas Day, though. Mm -hmm. Downsizing, we have to watch Downsizing. We're going to watch Coco. My parents normally do not like Pixar films, oh. or at least they, they don't necessarily seek them out. Mm -hmm. And for one of the first times ever, my mom text messages me. She's like, how's this Coco? Am I going to like this Coco? Co and Yes, yeah. you will, Mom and M's. Yes, Go you will. Go see it. Um, Disaster Artist and Three Billboards. Yeah, so that's where choices. our holiday list is at right now. Mm -hmm. And by graphic, I mean you just see full frontal. So that's the truth, right? It's not these graphic sexual scenes like something of nine and a half weeks or something, but it's, it's, you do see graphic nudity and that's your decision to make if you don't want to see that. All right, yeah. good way to break it down there. Yeah. All right, last question for the day comes from Gordon who writes, it's the end of the year, so what better time for a little reflection? I was wondering if you had a favorite memory from 2017 or maybe, maybe a favorite video you worked on or something you did that you're most proud of. Thanks for all you guys do. Can't wait for a 2018 filled with killer content. Mm. Me too, Gordon. So I think my favorite memory from Collider 2017 is no doubt going to Star Wars Celebration. Oh yeah, the celebration, so, not the premiere. Interesting. Yeah, more so wow. celebration. There, there were. I, I mean, I love the premiere, and I'll never forget that night right, either. Right. But celebration just had so many different layers to it that made it so special to me. So mm -hmm. I went to Celebration London in 2016, and I had a blast. Again, another thing I will never forget. Mm -hmm. But. There was a striking difference because 2017 was spent with the Collider crew. I went right. alone 2016. 2017 was with my Collider family. And also we had the uh, the Schmodown panel and the Jedi Council panel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's one thing to see a view count on a video we do go up and see comments and, you know, maybe good job, nice comments even. Right. Being in a room with so many of you guys and feeling that energy and excitement for content that we create. I mean, I'm proud of everything we do, but mm -hmm. to actually see there and get to witness and feel it, that, oh, it brings so much freaking joy to my heart, <laughs> I can't stand it. And then also there was the meet and greet as well and mm -hmm. to be able to meet so many people and you know, they'll send me the pictures they took of us and just having those memories and yeah. having people 
feel like real people and not just, uh, you know, likes or comments. Just getting to meet you guys is something that's really special to me. So mm -hmm. I, I think I would have to say that was my favorite Collider memory of 2017. Well, I think the meet and greet is a great place to start. I think for me, the New York Comic Con meet and greet was incredible. Yeah. It was incredible leading into the doing a stand up again for the second time in front of Mark Ellis. And, I didn't and get what in. a great. And no, no, you didn't get in. Right. I didn't get in. And what a great crowd they were. And so to me, it was the combination of all that was one of the best nights I've ever experienced. Um, um, most recently, the Jumanji thing was my, one of my greatest achievements of the year, and myself personally. I'm still building a resume, still building a name in this business to get a shot to interview those three incredibly talented men and have them play along with something as outlandish as a promo off to promote Jumanji means a lot. And to have the views be over 100,000 and people leaving great comments, honestly, is very humbling, that kind of stuff. And it means a lot to me. It means that I'm working hard and things are coming. Uh, I'm seeing results of the work I'm doing, and that means a lot. And it's great to get the support from the Collider crew, from everyone here at Collider. It's been awesome to be a full-time employee over the last few months. So I, I'm, I'm happy all around. I've told you, that video was awesome. Thank and you. It's, it's intimidating walking into a junket setting yeah, like that with is. folks like that. Yeah. So job well done. Just to throw out a couple Thank more you. videos that I'm really proud of. Uh, Behind the scenes and bloopers. Oh yeah. Rest in peace, but I will say that going back, some of those just, again, warm my heart. And I think my favorite one of the bunch is the baby picture one. Mm. I think that was one of the ones that we had the most fun. We had fun making every single one of those, but I think that was the one where going around and doing the interviews, it was the most fun to do. Yeah, because people yeah. just had such a great time seeing baby pictures of everybody. And <laughs> yeah, now everyone will forever confuse. Me and Ken, but it's fine. No big deal. No big deal at all. Um, also, actually, top fifty. I want to throw that out oh, as yeah. well because top is great. And it was a, an incredible challenge mm -hmm. to produce, but it really was like this incredible group effort. And I know not everybody agrees with the list, and it was never going to be a list that everyone was going to be a hundred percent happy with. But really, the team here, the editing, the producing, the production, the people who sat there for hours doing those interviews. Mm -hmm. I look at that series and I'm like, wow, like, look at what we can do. So job well done, team. Thank you to everybody who supported that series. It meant a lot to us. And uh, that, that's it. I think that's, that's, yeah. That's it. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Collider Mailbag. You guys know what to do if you want one of your questions read on air here. Collidervideo at gmail.com. Send it there. Roka, thank you so much for joining me again today. This was a fun weekend. Thank you. Have a Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. You'll be with your family by the time this will. airs. That I will. Have Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays to all of you all. Thanks so much for watching us throughout the entire year and for all your comments and support and even some of the constructive criticism. All of it matters. Mm -hmm. So enjoy yourself. Have a great time. Happy Holidays. Take care of yourself. Do the right things. Enjoy your time with your family and friends. And most of all, take care of yourself. All right? We want you here in 2018. I will second everything he just said. Wish you all the happiest holidays. Keep an eye out for more content on the channel. We may not have live movie talk every day next week, but we do have individual top five lists. We have more top 50 videos, a couple other things sprinkled in there. So keep an eye out for that. Have a very happy, healthy new year, everybody. We will see you real soon. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.